let's start with a theorem that seems fairly straightforward, and in a lot of ways it is, but there's actually some very important consequences of such a simple little theorem. So let's say we have a ring, it has a unity one, and we can make a mapping from the integers into that ring given by the integer n maps to n times one. And remember what that means in terms of a ring. When you do n times one, when that's an integer, you're basically adding n copies of one. Let's go ahead and actually prove this theorem. So we need to show that this mapping preserves addition and preserves multiplication. So let's start with addition. So let's say that m and n are integers. So what is phi of m plus n? Well, by definition, it's m plus n times 1. So again, 1 added together m plus n times. But if I'm just adding 1 m plus n times, that's the same thing is adding one m times plus adding another copy, another n copies of one. So that's equal to phi of m plus phi of n. And certainly it preserves addition. Now multiplication is not a whole lot harder, but it does involve a few things that we've looked at previously. So if I have phi of m times n, again, by definition, that would be mn times 1. Well, that's equal to mn times 1 times 1, since 1 times 1 has to be 1. And it's important to realize that's not the one as in the integer one, that's the one as the ring element. But even so, the unity for the ring times itself has to equal the unity for the ring. Now, something that we looked at previously. When I have this kind of thing for a ring with unity, I can say that's equal to m times 1 times n times 1. Again, this is more complicated than it looks because this isn't just integer multiplication, but we have shown that this works regardless. And then again, of course, now that I've got there, this is phi of m times phi of n. It preserves addition, it preserves multiplication, therefore this mapping is a homomorphism. Like I said, there's not much to the actual theorem, but there's some important consequences. If we have a ring with unity, and the characteristic of that ring is a positive number greater than zero, then that ring has to contain a subring that's isomorphic to Zn. Why is that? Well, let's think about that. We know from our theorem that phi mapping z to this ring by this whole thing, n goes to n times 1, is a homomorphism. Now the characteristic of r is n, so we know specifically that n times 1 has to be 0, but also that nothing less than n times 1 can equal 0, because that's basically what the characteristic of the ring means. So if I just look at the set of all multiples of 1, if I just take the set of all k times 1, such that k is an element of z, That's going to be, first of all, there have to be n elements because of this whole characteristic thing. And this thing is going to be a cyclic. Well, 
it's going to be isomorphic to Zn is really what it boils down to. Addition-wise, it's going to be cyclic, and then multiplication-wise, it's going to work as well. Okay. Now, showing it for that the if the characteristic is zero, then it contains a subring isomorphic to Z, is well basically the same thing. This same thing now is the characteristic is never going to come around, and so just the simple mapping is going to have to be an isomorphism. We can take that even further. If we start with a field of characteristic P, then F contains a subfield isomorphic to ZP. Well, that's just an application of this previous corollary. If the characteristic is P, it has to have a submarine isomorphic to ZP. And of course, ZP is a field, so it's a subfield that's going to be isomorphic. Easy. Now, it's a little bit tougher if we got a field of characteristic zero. What we have to do is say, create a field is the set of all A, B inverse, and we know we have inverses because we're working in a field, such that A and B are in S, where S is, again, pulling off the previous corollary, S is the subring isomorphic to Z. Now we have to put an additional condition that, of course, B can't be equal to zero because again, B doesn't have multiplicative inverses, even in a field. Now, again, I'm not gonna go through all the details of this here, but if you think about this, A, B inverse, if you're thinking number-wise, that's the same thing as A over B. By creating it like that, making be saying these things work the same thing as A over B, you're basically creating an integer divided by an integer. You're basically creating rational numbers. By doing this, we're getting things that are isomorphic to the rational numbers.